Well, it looks like it's time to start. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm coming to you live from my home in North Berkeley. Uh, I hope you're all staying well and in good health. Uh, I'm going to pick up today where I left off uh, last week, Thursday. And we were talking about memories. And um, last time we talked mainly about memory circuits, and this time I'm going to focus more on memory blocks. That, this shouldn't take the whole hour and a half. I think uh, we'll finish this lecture up, and then we're going to move on to uh, talking about uh, parallelism. So the first memory. I'm going to move forward to where we were last time. So somewhere around here. So we're talking about combining memory blocks. And um, let me put this in play mode. Right. So uh, we talked about if you have a smaller memory block, and you, you can use multiple instances of that block to, to make a larger one. And we make larger memory blocks in kind of two dimensions. One is possibly to make it wider, to make the words wider. And the other is to make it deeper. So we, just as a quick review, last time we talked about increasing the width. We can do that in this example by using two memory blocks and hooking, uh, using uh, the upper memory block to supply the output bits 8 through 15, and the lower memory block to supply the output bits 0 through 7. So they, they just work in parallel. So they share the, the write enable signal, they share the address lines, and, and they each have their own data input and data output. If we want to increase the depth, we can also use two memories. But in this case, we use the, uh, the way I designed it here is we use the uh, lower memory block for the uh, first, the lower addresses and we use the upper memory block for the higher addresses. Okay, and then we can choose the proper output between the two blocks by using a multiplexer on the output. And the extra address bit that we need in order to address more words of the memory is used to control the multiplexer for the reading. I think we can also use it to control the write enable so that when we write, we write into the proper block dependent on are we in the upper half of the memory or in the lower half of the memory space. Okay. So that's a pretty simple operation to put together two instances of a memory block to build a deeper memory. I think this is where we left off last time. Now, um, the other thing you might want to do is add a, um, a read port to a simple dual port memory. So just to remind you what I mean by simple dual port memory, this is a memory block as shown here that has uh, a write port and a read port and two different addresses so that it can simultaneously read and write. Right? So it's a dual ported memory, but we call it a simple dual ported memory because there's a single read port and a single write port. And this port, the, the write port is dedicated for writing and this port on the right side is dedicated for reading. So um, this type of memory, it has, obviously it has a single, uh, a single read port, but let's say we wanted to have a memory that had one write port and two read ports. So that's the problem I'm stating here is how do we add a read port to a simple dual ported memory? This might come up, for instance, if you wanted to build a register file um, or something where you need multiple read ports. So how could we do that? Well, we can actually change the memory block, but we can use another block, which can provide that second read port, right? So um, the idea is that uh, we're gonna write, when we do a write, we write it to both memories, right? And then when we can, that, that way, then the, all the data is copied in both memories. And then when we do, we can do two reads simultaneously, we could read from the top memory the same time we can read from the bottom memory. That gives us our two read ports. Um, and uh, they can be independent. They can be reading different memory addresses. Okay, so this is a simple modification. We use the write enable um, to go to both memory ports. 
because when we write, as I said, we're going to write to both places. And then we share the data in for both memories and both memories share the same address for the write. Right. So again, what we do is just write the same uh, data into both, mem both memories at the same location. And then independent of that, we can read either or both memories in that way we can get two reads at the same time. Right. So it kind of, of course, it doubles the size of the memory, but this is one way to do it if, if you're stuck with a single dual port memory and you need more multiple ports, you can just add more memory blocks and then write to them all simultaneously. Okay, so that's a fairly simple thing to do. Another thing we might want to do is figure out how to add a write port to a simple dual ported memory. Um, and this is a little trickier, um, but there is a technique we can do and I'm gonna show you that here. Uh, let's say we're given this 1k by 8 single, a uh, simple dual ported memory, and we want a one read and two write port memory. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, we can use another block. And this time then, um, we need to have two independent write ports. So what can we do? Well, we can allow one write port to write one of the writes to happen into the top memory, and then the second write that write into the second memory. And then later when we read, we just have to read that particular address from the memory that was last written to, All right? So we can do that as shown here. If we have a multiplexer here, and we can choose the proper memory to send the data to the output based on some function that tells us where that particular address is stored, right? Because if we want to allow these two to work independently, the two write ports, we don't know which address, which uh, memory the uh, data will end up with. So this function, this residency function will tell us either a zero or a one, oh, sorry, a zero here or a one here, will indicate which memory that address resides in, right? So, um, how do we come up with this residency function? Well, we can do that with another small memory. In this case, it'd be a one K by one memory because these memory blocks are a thousand words or a thousand eight bit words deep. We can use a simple smaller memory, which is one K by one, which maps tells us which is stored in it, we store either a zero or a one for each particular memory address, right? So when we write something into one of these memories, if we write into the top memory at that address A1, in the small memory, we put a one. Uh, if we do a write into this bottom memory at this address, a zero at the same time, we write a zero into this memory. Then later when the read happens, this memory is accessed right, according to the address right, on, the, on the read side, and it returns a, either a zero or a one, which is used to control the smux. So then it kind of remembers where we, this small memory here remembers where we last wrote uh, the data for some particular memory address. Right? So it's a little tricky scheme. Uh, this has to be a dual ported memory, but we could make it work. Okay, so that's um, how we can make, add a second write port to a simple dual ported memory. Okay, so that's um, all I wanted to say about this kind of combining memory blocks and kind of the, the way we might want to do it. Uh, the other thing we might want to do is use a memory block to build a structure called a, well, called a FIFO. You know what a FIFO is, it stands for first in, first out memory. And it turns out it's quite popular uh, kind of memory block that's used in digital design. Uh, it is a memory block, but it's accessed in a very particular way. Right? It's used for making queues, implementing queues. Um, it finds common use in computer systems and communication circuits because it gives us a way to kind of decouple the actions of a producer and a consumer. Right? The producer, which is producing data, uh, can perform many 
actions that can produce lots of data without the consumer performing any reads or vice versa. All right. So um, it kind of does a rate matching between a producer of data and a consumer of data. They don't have to work in exact synchrony. The, the producer could burst and generate a bunch of writes, and then the reader can come later and read at its own pace. However, um, without, a, if, without a finite buffer size, and this buffer is used to kind of rate match the writer and the reader, or the producer and the consumer. On average, though, we need to have an equal number of reads and writes, otherwise, otherwise we'd overflow this, this FIFO memory, right? So the action kind of is shown functionally over here in this picture. If, um, if the FIFO is in the starting state, so the FIFO is, is a memory block, but it has a special way, it has a, a writing, port and it has a reading port and um, internally the FIFO keeps track of the next position to do a write. Right? So if this FIFO is storing A, B, C and we write D after the write, D will appear here and then the kind of pointer that indicates the next position to do a write to has been kind of incremented to the next position and you can see then after read we kind of we get into this state here where the A is read out on the right on the side here. And next read would read B, next read would be C, would read C. But anyways, after the A read, the FIFO would be in this state here. So it looks like it's kind of like these data is kind of shift to the right um, as we read it and we fill in on the left side. This gets used in uh, interfacing IO devices. For instance, you could think about a network interface that connects a computer to the network. The data may come over the network at a rate different than the rate at which the processor wants to process the data. The processor might be doing something else, right? So the data might burst in and then um, uh, the processor might read the data from the network one at a time. Right, so the network can be running at a different speed than the processor. On average, they need to run at the same speed, but kind of they can have little bursty operations, um, and they don't have to be synchronized. Uh, another example would think about audio output. The processor is producing, maybe it's doing audio decoding from you know iTunes or something like that, and it will produce bursts of samples or blocks of audio sample to be sent out to the headphones uh, while the process is running. And then maybe it gets swapped out and some other process is running. Well, the processor can write the samples and do a FIFO. And then the audio D to A converter, which is sending the samples of sound out to the, um, uh, to the loudspeaker or to the headphones can operate at a very constant rate because it's going to send the samples out at a constant rate in order to produce the music. So it kind of, the FIFO decouples the action of those two. So it finds lots of uses. FIFO send, find lots of uses like that. So I wanted to show you a little bit about how FIFOs are designed without going into great detail. Um, here's kind of an abstraction of the interface of a generic FIFO. Uh, it would have a clock because it's a synchronous circuit. Uh, it would have a reset signal a data in, a write enable, uh, and then two, uh, a, a read enable, and then a data out. So on the rising edge of the clock, if write enable is asserted, then this data on data in will go into the FIFO. And then um, on the rising edge of the clock, if the read enable is inserted, then the uh, oldest value in the FIFO, the one that was written first will be read out on the data out. There's also typically some control signals that come out that tell the status of the FIFO. Right. So after read a write operation, the full and the empty signals indicate the, the status, the internal state. So uh, the um, and this, these signals, so they're full and empty. This full signal says if we do a write and the full signal then is asserted, that means that we've filled up the FIFO. And if we do a read and the empty signal is asserted, that means we've emptied the FIFO. There's no more data in it. These signals are used by external logic to control its own reading and writing to the buffer. So if external logic is a producer, it's producing data and it writes and then the full signal goes high, 
somehow this external logic will have to stop producing uh, data for a while until some read happens somewhere else and there's an additional slot available to do a write. Okay, so it kind of synchronizes the operation of the reader and the writer, these, these control signals do. Oftentimes there's a half full signal or some other indicator of par partial fullness. Uh, this is so that if it takes a while for the producer to turn itself off and stop producing data, it gets early warning saying, oh, it's half full or it's about to get full, so you better think about stopping to produce data. Okay, so it makes a more graceful way to control the external logic, um, both the writer and the reader, in fact. Okay, so the way these things are typically um, uh, designed, you could design them with shift registers, but it turns out not to be a very energy efficient way of doing these things these days. Um, more typically use memory blocks. So um, with a memory block, when you use an address pointer to keep track of the, uh, the, the next place to write data and the next place from which to read data, right? So we have a write pointer, which points to the, to the next, sequentially next empty location in the memory block. And there's a read pointer which points to the oldest, the, the um, first in data, the, the one that was re, uh, written the longest ago. So what happens on a write then, um, the, we write the data into that location and then the write pointer gets incremented to point to the next place. On a read operation, we send this data out to the output and then the read pointer moves to the next location. So both a read and a write will increment the pointers, but you can see we kind of run out of place in the pointer, it just kind of circulates back. So this is kind of a circular buffer. So the pointer incrementing is done modulo the size of the buffer. Okay. Now doing incrementing mod a number can be complicated, but if that number is a power of two, then it's trivial. Right, because if this, for instance, if this pointer, if this memory memory held 256 locations, that would mean we need an 8-bit pointer. If we use a normal counter for doing this incrementing, we'd increment, increment. This would get all. This would be pointing. This the value of the pointer at this location would be 255. If we increment that, it would just go back to zero, right? because that's the natural behavior of the counters we've talked about earlier this semester is that they just roll around. They just uh, do mod, they do increment, they actually do increment mod, um, you know, the, the maximum value that the counter can hold. So, so it turns out that's a pretty simple way to, to manage the pointers for a FIFO would be to uh, just use counters and let them roll around or roll over. So um, to kind of get the proper control signals though, after a read operation, if the pointers are equal, okay, I'm sorry, after a write operation, if the pointers become equal, that means we've just filled up the FIFO, right? So the full, full signal will, should be asserted. Similarly, uh, if the read and write pointer have the same value after read operation, that means we've, written, we've read the last value out of the FIFO. Right, and so we should indicate that with the empty signal. Right, so you can imagine there's just simple combinational logic circuits that uh, look at the values of the read and write pointers and can uh, generate the full or the empty signals um, accordingly. Right. So the control logic for FIFO is pretty simple. There's some combinational logic for generating the full and empty, and then there's some counters that act um, as give us the function of these pointers. So this, um, these FIFOs are, are pretty important and they, they show up a lot and they are useful to have in FPGA. So uh, most FPGAs these days include FIFOs. They're built right into the uh, reconfigurable uh, fabric. Uh, we're gonna talk about it a little later today, but in the Vertex 5, for instance, there's RAM blocks and part of the RAM blocks is uh, the, those are large memory blocks which can be used as general purpose memories, but they can also be used as FIFOs because there's dedicated circuits 
that surround the RAM block as shown in this picture here and do the implement the read and the write pointer and the static lo the status flag logic. Right. So, um, because these circuits that are needed in order to turn a RAM block into a FIFO are, are rel relatively small. So, the designers of FPGAs add these into the hard coded circuits just to provide this uh, capability to the user, excuse me, to the users. Um, and um, as it turns out, these RAM blocks that we're going to see are in included inside FPGAs. They're dual ported memories. They have two ports. So uh, it takes advantage of the fact that these memories have, are dual ported. And in the case of FPGAs, actually, you can use a different clock for reading than is used for writing. Okay. So I think that's all I wanted to say about FIFOs. Let me check the chat here, see if there's any questions. It's funny, I can't see the chat when I'm sharing the screen. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, so next I wanted to talk about, oops, well, not there. I'm gonna talk more about memory, so I'm gonna go back to the other one. Uh, memories on FPGAs. So uh, FPGAs would be a lot less useful if they didn't have lots of memory. It turns out many computations that we do need memory blocks in one form or another to hold the state of the computation. Right? And we already talked about uh, logic blocks in, in, in the FPGAs. And logic blocks include FIFO, uh, include, sorry, include flip-flops. Uh, usually there's about one flip-flop per lot. And, um, that provides some memory, but it, uh, it's really not enough memory. It's, it's uh, most applications of FPGAs need large memory blocks and for one purpose or another. So there's actually multiple different types of memory resources on FPGAs. Here's this picture I showed previously of the Vertex 5, kind of an oldish FPGA now, but it's a simple one, so it's easy to talk about. Um, there's uh, these columns in purple here are uh, the large memory blocks. We're going to talk about those of SRAM blocks, similar to the SRAM that we talked about uh, last week. There's also distributed RAM among the LUTs which, um, in the, the configurable logic blocks. And I'll talk about those too. And then new FPGAs also have a, another type of memory, a kind of super memory blocks. And I'll show you some of those later. Okay, so first of all, the concept of um, a slice M. Remember uh, when we talked about FPGAs, we said that the LUTs and the flip-flops are kind of organized into slices. And in the case of the um, this vertex architecture we looked at, there's four LUTs um, uh, per slice and four flip-flops. Now, if you, if you look at the internal circuitry for a LUT, a LUT has some latches and then a multiplexer really, that chooses the proper latch value to send to its output. Um, so it was figured out about a decade ago or so that those latches, they could be used for storing the configuration of LUTs, but those can also could be used as little memories. Right. So a slice M is a... Uh, logic slice, but also that also can be used as a small memory. So if you look at the interface of this thing, it, it has the usual inputs to the six slot. Uh, and it has the normal five or six slot outputs over here, but it also has a data input and it has uh, a write address pins for writing into the, into this block, into this slice M. Right. So um, the, the change is shown here. I'm not going to go through all the details, but this is the slice that we saw previously with the LUTs here. This is the carry logic for implementing fast adders. These are the flip-flops. It looks like that only these, these LUTs here, we can use those as small memories. And um, here's a way, here's an example that shows how to use these, uh, these four LUTs 
with these multiplexers here. And all the LUTs get combined together. In this case, we're configuring this thing to be a 256 bit by one memory, which has a registered output if we want. Right, so each LUT here is responsible, since it has six inputs, right, it has uh, two to the six or 64 latches in here, and those latches can be written and read by the user. Right, so this thing ceases to be a LUT and it acts more like a small memory. So if we gang together four of those, we get 64 bits from each, and these are put in a way to give us uh, four times the depth of a single 64-bit version, so we get 256 bits um, by one, one bit wide. Right? So um, that's a nice way. It's a lot denser memory than just using the flip-flops because normally these LUTs would only have four flip-flops each, but here we really get effectively get 64 latches per uh, per well, LUT. So, um, and of course it's very flexible because FPGAs need to have a lot of flexibility. So these are all the uh, different configurations that can be built from a single slice, right? Um, you can see all the options here, single ported 32 bit by one, um, up to this, what I showed a minute ago, single ported 256 by one. There's a two, um, you can put it into a two bit wide mode and get the two, use two halves independently. Um, there's dual ports, you know, all these things that can be built from a single slice. Okay, so lots of process, uh, flexibility there. Um, and this one, this diagram shows the timing, I'm not gonna go into it, but just remind you that this um, LUT RAM is, I guess I don't say it here. Uh, this LUT RAM has uh, asynchronous reading and synchronous writing. So it uses, kind of acts like a, like a collection of flip-flops in the sense that it uses the clock for doing a write operation, but the read operation is just combinational. So uh, in this picture here, if uh, we put an address here, um, we can write synchronously with the clock when the write enable is activated. Um, for read, if the write enable is zero or low, we'll put an address here and the, the data corresponding to that address will just appear at the output without needing a clock. So it's like a combinational read or an asynchronous read. Okay, so that's one type of uh, memory resource on the FPGA. The, they call it, uh, the vendors call it distributed RAM because it's distributed among the, um, the combinational logic blocks. Okay, the other one is uh, block RAMs, and these are concentrated blocks of memory, much denser than the distributed RAM. And uh, in the case of the, the Xilinx FPGA, there's uh, each memory block has 32,000 bits of data total. Um, and this can be configured as one large memory as two, or as two 18K bit RAMs. Um, and the nice thing about it is there's lots of flexibility in the width and depth, right? So we can trade off the depth for the width. So each 32K bit block could be either 64K bit by one, um, or it could be 32, two, uh, I guess that's right, um, 32K by one, 16K by two, 8K by four, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see you can make it less deep but make it wider, right? and that's all configurable. Um, there, in this, because this is built like SRAM block, similar to what I talked about last week, uh, it needs the clock for doing both the reading and the writing, so it has a write um, and a read that are both synchronous operations. Right? And it has two ports, and the ports um, are symmetric um, and totally independent, but they can use a different clock. Uh, the only thing that's shared is the data. So it's a true uh, dual ported memory. Um, and each port can be configured in one of the available widths independent of the other port. So you could have the right port, one port be a narrow deep port and the other one be a less narrow, um, you know, maybe a wide port, but less deep. Okay. 
And the other nice feature about these memories is the content of the memory can be initialized or cleared by the configuration bitstream. So when the FPGA chip is for a program, when the logic blocks are programmed, the memory can also be initialized with values that are stored as part of the configuration stream. Right. So this is a very handy way to initialize the memory in your design. And then this shows the timing diagram. It's again, it's synchronous read or write, and it's reflected here in the in the diagram. Uh, by the way, the typical maximum clock rate is roughly uh, even with modern day FPGAs around 400 or 500 megahertz. Right? So it's, this is one of the slowest paths on the FPGA. It's one of the critical paths. So this oftentimes, if your design involves uh, memory accesses, this is often a part of the design that sets the maximum clock frequency. Uh, those of you taking the FPGA lab, you probably won't get your processors running at this speed. You, you probably use these memory blocks for your data memory and the instruction memory, I know you will. Um, and which means in principle, you can get processors running about 400 megahertz, but you're gonna find some other critical paths because we only have a three stage pipeline. So your designs, uh, a good design will run at 100 megahertz. If you work really hard at it, you might get it running faster. So the memory won't be the bottleneck for you. Okay, and then, um, Meant, I just wanted to mention on more modern FPJs, there's another class of memory blocks. These are ultra RAM blocks. They're bigger memory blocks and they have less flexibility. Um, you can see a comparison here in this diagram. A RAM block is two clocks, so you can have independent read and write ports or independent two independent uh, ports. In ultra RAM, there's only a single clock. Um, there's no built-in FIFO function in, in the ultra RAM. And uh, the RAM blocks, as I mentioned in the last slide, were configurable in, in the width, data width, in the ultra RAM, it's fixed at 72 bits, right? So, um, and the ultra RAM is a, is a simple dual port. It's not a true dual ported memory. Meaning each port, there's two ports, but one is dedicated as a write and the other is dedicated as a read. You can't have each port be either a read or a write, okay? But these are denser. And so they're handy for larger memories. Uh, this just shows kind of a summary of, this is the kind of state of the art latest FPGAs. And this table shows uh, the columns are different FPGAs in the family that can be bought. The ones on the right are more expensive because they're bigger chip area. The ones on the left are smaller, fewer resources and cheaper. But if we look at just this kind of state of the art one, we can see what all the different um, kind of available resources on the FPGAs are. And right now I'm focusing on the memories. Uh, first of all, the CLBs have flip-flops. Remember, as I mentioned, there's roughly one flip-flop per lot. And so on the state-of-the-art design here, uh, chip here, the 37P Vertex Ultrascale, there's uh, 2.6 million of those flip-flops. You look at the distributed RAM. This is the, the RAM that uses the, the LUT logic. This one is 36.7 megabits on this chip total. So the block RAMs have a total. I don't, uh, you can see how many block RAMs, I think. Let's see. Yeah, there's 30. No, I don't see the number of block RAMs, but the total capacity is. Uh, 70.9 megabits and then this ultra ram you can see uh, these there's more of that there's 270 megabits uh, from ultra ram okay. so quite a bit of memory resources on fpgas a good amount of the die area is dedicated to uh, memory bits okay so i'm going to stop for a second and pause if there's any questions Nope. So I'm going to share again. Okay. Um, the other big use for memory blocks in, at least in computer systems, is caches. And um, caches come up quite a bit, and they come up in this class uh, in the lab, in particular in the ASIC lab, part of your project in addition to building the RISC-V processors to build um, caches for it. 
So I thought I would just review cash operation here briefly. Uh, it's a big topic and we cover it quite extensively in 61C and in 151 other classes, but I thought it'd be good just to do a summary here since we're talking about memory blocks. So there's a kind of a historical perspective to this. If, if you go back to a long time ago to 1977, we were in a situation where um, DRAM was faster than microprocessors. So this is uh, kind of typical was the Apple II computer. This was the first kind of mass produced personal computer uh, it was Apple and of course founded by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. This just shows a picture of that, of that yeah, computer. And interestingly, back then, stuck. Share in a different way. Let's see. Back then, uh, CPUs had a clock rate, clock frequency of 1,000 nanoseconds, but an, uh, uh, about a microsecond. And DRAM memory could be accessed in about 400 nanoseconds. So the, the DRAM was actually faster than the CPU, more than twice as fast. So this processor was built where, um, this is the clock period here. It's used for clocking the CPU. That's the one microsecond you can see here. It's a little blurry, sorry. The first half of the clock period was used to access the memory for the video refresh uh, video screen. And the second half was used to process uh, for the processor to access data um, or instructions. And um, this was back when the, uh, the display, the frame buffer for the display was stored in the DRAM along with the programs and the data for the processor. Right. So the video processor, I think it's shown here, yeah. The video subsystem that was responsible for the display could have access to the memory half the time. And then the other half of the time, the processor had access to the memory. So this worked out pretty nicely. And there's no need for caches here because the DRAM could keep up with the requirements of the, the rest of the system. But things change. So if you look at what happened over time from around that time, from around 1980 or so, uh, over the years, the performance of CPUs increased as we know, because of Moore's law and the effects of Moore's law. Circuits got faster um, and the architectures got more advanced, got deeper pipelines, et cetera. So the latency of the performance went up. Uh, DRAM though, kind of stuck with the old architecture. It was hard to make those go faster, partly because they got bigger and bigger memories are slower inherently. And it's kind of hard to pipeline the memory much. So there was this growing gap that happened between the speed of DRAM memory and CPUs, right? So back in the early days, like I said, in 77, the, DP, uh, the DRAM could keep up with the CPU, but it was pretty clear over time because the, the difference in the growth rates, that there was an increasing gap between the speed of DRAM memory and the speed of CPUs. This gap grew for about 50% per year. So um, what did architects do to address this gap? Well, this is where caches came in. We put a smaller, faster cache memory between the CPU and the DRAM. And this kind of creates a memory hierarchy where you have really fast memory in the form of registers in the CPU, and then you have a slightly, a bigger, but slightly slower memory close to the CPU in the form of a data cache and instruction cache. And then maybe you have another cache that's bigger and slightly slower um, that feeds the first cache, et cetera, et cetera. Early systems would just have one level of cache and then the cache would connect directly to the DRAM. Um, at this point in time, because the gap is so huge in the speed between the, the kind of access times between DRAM and CPUs, we actually use multiple levels, typically three levels of cache and high performance processors. So caches have been great. I mean, it's really been the main thing that, uh, one of the things that has allowed us to scale processor performance over the years, uh, even though memory hasn't 
speed hasn't uh, continued to scale up and, and over over the years. And the reason caches work and they work amazingly well is that the programs that we write and run exhibit uh, locality. And as a review, you remember that there's really there's two different types of locality. There's temporal locality. This means locality in time. This says if a item, a data item is referenced, it, it will probably be referenced again soon. Right? So the probability of, of uh, referencing a data item is higher if it's been referenced in the, uh, in the, in the, new, in the near past. Um, then there's spatial locality that says if an item is referenced, items whose addresses are close to it tend to be referenced also. Right? Um, so we know both of these are true. And if you think about program execution, it's pretty obvious that there is a good amount of locality. And caches take advantage of that because caches store uh, data items close to the processor. And if we means we can, if we need to access that data item repeatedly, we can re repeatedly access it from the cache rather than going back to a large, slow data memory every time we need it. And also if we move data from the large memory to the cache, and we also not just bring that data item in, but also data items whose addresses are close, then um, we will save some work later because uh, you know, there's a good chance if we access something, we're gonna access its neighbors as well. So we might as well bring its, late, its neighbors along for the ride. Um, so what this does is present, when we build this memory hierarchy, it presents the user with what looks like a very large memory and we can build a large memory out of um, cheap, cheapest memory technology and then use the kind of faster, more expensive memory to provide the, uh, and, and do that in a smaller form and uh, provide the faster um, access. So typically the DRAM memory is used for the slow but cheap and dense because DRAM is relatively slow, but it's cheap because Remember, the bit cells are really small. We can make it very dense. We can put lots of bits per chip. Okay, so it's good for presenting the user with the large, uh, big memory. And the SRAM is usually used um, for the fast, for the caches because it's fast, but expensive, relatively expensive. Um, but it's not as dense. Okay, so the combination of the two, though, give us some, this nice combination of big and fast. And the reason we can present that illusion is because of locality. Okay, so uh, if we look at our kind of pipeline processor that we talked about earlier a few weeks ago with the RISC-V, uh, we had the instruction uh, memory here and we had the data memory here. Well, in real systems, we don't, you know, we would, that data memory really be at uh, primary the level one, the level one in data cache and this instruction memory would really be the level one instruction cache. In a simple system, these would connect well, these connect to upper levels of the memory hierarchy. In a simple system, that would just be a DRAM, but this could also be a level two cache. Um, and then maybe the level two connects to the DRAM or the level two connects to level three and the level three connects to the DRAM. Uh, these days, it's rare to have more than three levels of cache. So what happens is, um, of course, since this data memory and the instruction memory can't store all the instructions for the program, probably it's too small. And the data memory is, the data cache is probably too small to store all the data that's needed by the memory. There will be some traffic back and forth. And so if the program tries to access a data item that's not in the cache, it'll produce a miss or not hit signal. And that will go to the controller or the processor and the processor will have to deal with it. And a simple processor will just stall the pipeline until the upper level of memory hierarchy can provide the data to this data cache, and then the program can continue executing. Likewise for the instruction cache. On a more sophisticated superscalar processor where it can execute instructions out of order, uh, the controller will find a way to keep the program going until it actually absolutely needs that data item. Right? It can find instructions that aren't waiting for that data item and execute those. So um, just to give you an idea of the size of memory 
a, a size of caches in a modern day memory hierarchy. This is this is a die photo for the uh, Nehalem, which is the Intel i7 or i5, which is a very popular processor used in notebook computers and other places. Uh, this one is a four core version of it. Uh, the newer ones have more cores. Um, we can um, kind of look at, uh, so here are the four cores here. You can see them in the die photograph. That's a bus interface for PCIe. Um, each core actually has a dedicated L1 and an L2, and then all the cores share an L3 cache. And you can see each one is larger. These are all, of course, this is all just six transistor SRAM type memory. You can see the individual memory blocks inside this um, L3 cache as we talked about. And then each cache has its own controller that is used for uh, handling misses and filling filling in data when it needs to. Um, so here's, here are the sizes, uh, the L1 caches, uh, the instruction cache and the data cache are both uh, 32K bytes. Um, they have a slightly different organization. They're both set associative caches, caches that we'll talk about in a second, but they have a different uh, different amount of associativity. Uh, then this L2 cache is 256K bytes. And then the common, the shared, this is the shared L3, which is shared by all three cores, um, is, a, um, you can see here it's eight megabytes. And then this is the memory controller here up here. This is used for connecting the L3 cache to the uh, DRAM. I'm wondering why the memory controller is not <laughs> here next to the L3 cache. It seems like that would make more sense, but I'm not sure why they did it that way. Okay. Um, so that's a real, you know, kind of a real modern day memory hierarchy. So I just want to review the different cache organizations briefly. Um, and it kind of comes in three different flavors. Um, and the first kind of simplest type of cache is a direct map cache. And this is um, where we store data into the cache according well, the, the, the trick to understanding the way caches work is to look at the way that we use the memory address of a cache. So when the processor um, produces a memory address, either from a load or a store instruction, um, the cache uses that memory address and um, kind of breaks it into different fields for different functions. And the, the lowest field is a byte select. So this says when we store data in the cache. The cache is organized in terms of blocks. In this example, there's 32 bytes in one block. Right. So we can assign the low five bits of the address. Since two to the five is 32, these low five, low five bits are used to indicate for this particular address, which byte it's corresponding to. Right. So there's kind of a pointer into the block. The, uh, the, they'll call it the byte select. The next bits, in this case, uh, this example, there's five bits here, bits five through nine, which are used to as an index into this cache. So this says, when we take a uh, data block from memory and we put it into the cache, we're gonna put it into a location that's indicated by the index here, okay? So that means every block, in memory has a unique place where it can live in the cache. And it also means that a lot of different blocks would all get assigned to the same location in the cache. Okay. So in order to know which particular block is resident in the cache at any point in time, when we store the data in the cache, we also store a tag. And the tag just uh, comprises the top bits of the address. We just use those bits because they're going to be unique for each um, each block, right? So when we store the block, we also store a tag. So later, when it's time to do a read, you can check to see, use the index to bring out the data and the tag. Check the tag against the address of the 
the load instruction. If they match, that means the cache is holding that block. If they don't match, that means it's holding some other block that happened to map to the same index, and that will cause a miss, and then the cache controller will load that block from memory, put it in the cache at the proper location according to the index, put use the high bits of the address as the tag and store that. Okay, and then the read or the load instruction can complete. Okay, so that's a direct map cache and it's uh, kind of a simple organization. Um, a more complicated um, type of cache is a fully associative. And this cache has the property that has no cache index. With a fully associative cache, we can allow any block from memory to reside at any location in the cache. This provides more flexibility and therefore there won't be a conflict between blocks. If there's two blocks that happen to have the same index uh, from uh, according to a direct map cache scheme in a, a fully associative cache, they can both simultaneously reside in the memory. So, or in the, in the, in the cache. So there's fewer conflicts in using the cache. But this, this uh, kind of extra efficiency, so to speak, comes at the expense of uh, more complexity. It's harder, uh, takes more hardware in order to implement this cache as you see here. So what happens is uh, when we do a read operation, we have to compare every tag that's stored in the cache along with all the data blocks against the high bits of the address, the cache tag part of the address for the read operation. Right? So if we do the load, this comes from the processor, we compare it to all these tags. We'd like it to go fast, so we have to compare in par parallel. So there's lots of comparators here. There's a comparator for every block in the cache. Right? And then if one of those matches up, that tells us, oh, that's where the data block is. We can send that data up to the processor and indicate that there was a, there was a hit. Uh, if the, all these cache, uh, if all these uh, tag compares fail, that means there was a miss. The block isn't currently into the memory. And so we'd have to go in the cache. So the controller would go to the next level in the hierarchy, find the data, put it in the, into the cache, and then store the tag here. Okay. So the extra complexity is that we have all these comparison, comparators, but it's very flexible. Uh, usually what's used is some compromise between direct mapped and fully associative, and that's what we call set associative cache, which is shown on this slide here. Uh, this is an n-way set, as, well, this particular one is two-way set associative, but we can build n-way set associative, which means there's n different uh, entries for each cache index. Right, so when um, a block comes in, we have n different choices on where to put that memory block, right? So it provides this flexibility, some of the flexibility of the set associative without the full um, uh, expense, because then when we do a read, we only have to have two comparators in this example, because either for some particular cache index, the block is either gonna appear on the right side or on the left side. So we can just check them both in parallel and see if one of them matches, then we have a hit. And then we can use that to control a multiplexer, which sends the proper data out. Um, so those tags are checked in parallel. And then when it, if we're gonna do a write uh, into, the, into the cache, we have a choice. We can put it in one side or the other and the cache controller will figure out the best place to put it um, according to some scheme and um, the data will get stored there along with this tag and then later it can be found. Um, I forgot to mention that most caches also include these valid bits which indicate whether or not the cache for that particular location is holding uh, valid data or not because when the cache is initialized it might be full of garbage, right? So on each write or uh, either e for each write into the cache, either from the CPU on a store operation or from um, as a result of a cache miss and the data coming from the higher level of the memory hierarchy, the valid bit will be get set. It will get set when the write happens. Okay, so that's set associative. So, uh, in fact, you can you can think of a direct map cache as a uh, n way set associative uh, cache with n equal to one. And you can think of a fully associated cache as um, a 
anyway said associative where n is equal to the total number total number of blocks in the memory where each block is only one deep or we each uh, each way or each uh, direct map part of the of the cache is only one word deep okay so i think that's all i wanted to say about caches and stop for a second see if there's any questions looks like not share again okay and i'm just gonna finish up this discussion about memory blocks by um just a couple words about ram blocks and how they relate to the project and for the uh and these are processor design considerations and um, for the fpga version so the um one of the memories that you need to implement is a is a register file right this has 32 locations 32 bits each for this first five that we're implementing and um it's good for this to consider you could build this register file out of block rams or you could build it out of lut rams and we recommend lut rams because the size is close to what you need um if you remember i showed you the distrib distributed or the lut ram uh primitive configurations and they're you can set it up to be 32 or 64 deep, deep, which is the right depth that you need for a register file. And then to get the right width, you can just put multiple of these, 32 of these in parallel. Right. So it makes a nice, it's a nice efficient way to implement a register file. And these LUT RAM or distributed RAM configurations have the option of multiple ports, right? And this is useful for register files, of course, because for register file, you need to have for this processors we're building, you need to have two read ports and one write port. Um, the other thing is that this distributed RAM is asynchronous. It gives you asynchronous read. And this is, gives you some flexibility on where to put the register file in the pipeline. It doesn't have to be right at the beginning of a pipeline stage. Right? You can have a little combinational logic before it in a pipeline stage. So add some flexibility to the design and that's kind of nice. If you consider the instruction data memories, in the FPJ version, we're not actually building caches, probably. Um, and for this, you'd consider block RAM because you need high density, because you want relatively large instruction and data memories. Um, and the block RAMs we talked about for FPJ, they give you uh, 32K bits, right? And you can configure that to be 1K by 32 bit words. Right, so you get a natural 32-bit wide memory, you get a thousand words, which is probably sufficient for what we're doing. And the other nice thing is, as I mentioned, the configuration bitstream can be used to initialize the block ramps. So it gives you a simple way to bootstrap the processor. You can load a simple program into your process, into your instruction memory. At the same time, you configure the uh, the rest of the FVGA. So you're you got the memory there all initialize with the program you're ready to go so to reset the program counter to zero then the processor can type start executing right out of the instruction memory so that's a nice feature too so it gives you a way to bootstrap the processor easily so that's the fpga version if you uh considering the if we look at the asic version of the processor uh it's similar we we also need to have a register file uh, for this, you could use a synthesized RAM. And what we mean by this is you can, in Verilog, you can specify uh, memory, uh, you can specify arrays of bits. And um, this gets synthesized by the uh, logic synthesis tools into, um, uh, by default, into flip-flops, collections of flip-flops with muxing to choose the proper output, similar to what we're doing in the homework assignment. Um, and for this size, for a thousand bits like this, the synthesized memory is competitive in size to the dense uh, RAM blocks. We have dense RAM blocks that you can use. Um, but because of the overhead of the RAM block, all the, you know, sense amps and the decoders and the read-write logic and all that, those RAM blocks um, have a lot of overhead. So for a small number of bits like this, the flip-flop based 
blocks are not so bad. They're, they're similar to size as the dense RAM blocks at this size. Right? So you can specify that with Verilog, the RAM block, and you'll get a synthesized memory. If you want to save on area, there's a way um, to use latches instead of flip-flops. And it's uh, slightly more sophisticated, but if you're interested in that, you can ask us about it. And you can save on area and get a higher speed. So that's a nice thing to look at, a latch-based design. And again, that's synthesized. Um, again, these if you do it this way, you get asynchronous read. So it might be it might be again useful for providing for providing flexibility on where to put the register file in the pipeline. Um, and then for the instruction and the data caches in this project, you actually will be building caches. Uh, of course, you want to use a generated dense block RAM. Um, so these are external blocks that are not synthesized through logic synthesize. These are typically provided through uh, memory generators, and we have those. Um, I don't think we have those access to you, but we, we don't have access for them for you, but we've pre-generated a bunch of different memories, and they're in our library, and you can use those. Uh, we provide those blocks for you, and you can put them together to build your caches. Okay, okay. so that's uh, what everything I wanted to say about memories for now. And um, there's no questions on that. After I get a drink of water, we'll move on to the next next topic. Okay, so I'm going to uh, bring up the next set of slides. And it's this one on, on parallelism. So this is lecture 15. And um, I'm going to talk about parallelism, and it's you'll see in a few minutes why I like to talk about this. But it's it's really at the core of hardware design is understanding and exploiting parallelism, and it really is the one thing that distinguishes hardware design from software design is that hardware design we do lots of things in parallel because the circuits all run in parallel, so can do many operations at the same time. We have to manage the parallel operation and the synchronization of all those operations. And that's, that's what makes hardware design a little challenging. Okay, so first, uh, what is parallelism? Well, uh, parallelism is the act of doing more than one thing at a time. Uh, as I mentioned just now, optimization and hardware design often involves parallelism to trade off between cost and performance. Right. And also we can use parallelism often to use to improve energy efficiency. If you remember back to the lecture when we were talking about power and energy, we used par parallel operations as a way to improve energy efficiency. If we can parallelize an operation, then we can um, use parallelism to speed up the operation. So get more work to, done per unit time more operations done per unit time, but then we can kind of restore it back to the original performance by lowering the uh, VDD and the clock frequency, right? And because VDD, because the energy scales with the square of VDD, the performance is generally scales linearly, we can get a effective improvement in the energy efficiency by doing that. As far as, as, far as optimization goes, the, if we're interested in trading off cost and performance, the way we can get higher performance by, is by using parallelism, but that comes at the expense of more cost. If we want to save costs and the design have fewer hardware components, we can do that, but then we have to stretch the computation out in time, right? So the performance goes down. So this is one of the big knobs that we have for controlling the trade-off between cost and performance. <laughs> So let me give you an example of that. Here's a simple kind of dumb example here is uh, computing the final grade for some student in some class. It's, it's not this class, but imagine that this, this class had three midterm exams, midterm one, two, and three in a project. And let's say we said we're gonna compute the grade as 20% uh, each for the uh, three midterms and then 
40% for the project grade. So we could write this little program that would compute your grade. You do read the midterm one, two, three scores and the project score, compute the grade and then I'll put the grade, right, write the grade. Okay, so something you'd probably do in a program, but if let's say you wanted to have a high performance hardware implementation of this, right? You can look at the operations that are needed here and we need, uh, let's see, three multipliers and we need uh, three adders, three plus signs here and we could implement this computational directly in the this computation directly in hardware, right? We'd use a, a th four multipliers and three adders, right? And this would give us this would be pretty much the the best performance we could get because we're doing as many things in parallel as we can, we're getting as much work done at, at once as possible. We can do this times uh, the point two times the each midterm grade and the point four times the project grade all in parallel. And then those values would pass on to the adders. And we'd reduce, we'd get partial result on these arcs here, and then it would go into a final adder and we get the final grade that way. So this would give us, um, kind of, you know, the parallelism is kind of maximized here at the beginning, and then there's less parallelism, right? And then there's even less parallelism, but we're still doing as much as we can at the same time. So uh, this would be a high performance implementation. Um, this I claim is the best we could do. Um, and in fact, there's kind of a theorem that says that there's a lower bound of log n uh, time to compute any function of n variables. And this is something that's, and in fact, this is a slide that I, I borrowed from um, Professor Demel's CS267 class, which is a class on uh, parallel computing. And you can see the proof here. You can use, uh, or the sketch of a proof here, you can use induction to show that this in fact is true. And uh, if you do that, you realize that the, the structure that leads to this kind of minimal time needed to compute this function of n variables is a balanced binary tree that looks like this. Right? Which kind of looks like what I had in the last slide when we did our operations in this kind of tree form. And if you do this n uh, function of n variables where the operators are these, these, these blue dots here and the values kind of run along these arcs, um, you can see that uh, since it's a tree, it's going to have log depth to it, log base to depth of it in this case. Right? So, and in fact, this is, we've seen this before when we've done reductions. Uh, you can imagine that these operations here, they're a plus sign here. We can, we could think of that as, um, as a Boolean or operation, and this would be a or reduction, right? Uh, or you can think of it as plus, uh, this could be adding integers together. It doesn't really matter. The structure of the computation is all the same. If you have n of these, n of them here, it's going to take log base 2 n time to do this kind of reduction, right? Where we reduce them all according to and or plus or whatever we choose this operator to be. And it's because the depth of this tree is log base 2, the number of inputs. So this kind of relates back to what I said a second ago. This is about a, a function of n variables. This is a particular type of function of n variables. And this comes up a lot in hardware des design. And we've seen this before, for instance, in comparator circuits and other things that do reductions. So um, question I ask here, what if this is all binary, we're doing a binary reduction. We could do a k-array k if, if our operator was a k-array function instead of a binary function, meaning instead of taking two uh, uh, inputs, we took k inputs, then these nodes here would have k inputs and the tree would, would flatten out because now instead of having log base two number of uh, levels in this tree, we'd have log base k levels in the tree, right? So, is um, that property that the, the depth of the tree is log base the area, the k area of the operators, and if k is two, then it's log base two. Okay, so um, we look at this uh, again. This is for addition. I'm showing 
two different types of trees. And I just wanted to kind of point out that you get this nice log base, this log delay result only for balanced trees. If you have a tree like this, the delay is um, order n, not order log n. All right, we're still doing a plus reduction of eight inputs, same as we're doing in the tree here, but we kind of reduce two of them and then reduce, then we add one more, and then we add one more, then we add one more. So this is a tree that's kind of long, skinny, deep tree. It has n delays through it, and this one has, the balanced one has log delays through it, right? Now, um, part of the fact, what I'm showing here is that actually different trees can do reductions. Usually we're interested in this, this kind of balanced one, but um, the property that we exploit when we do reductions or we do operations, we're kind of changing the order that we do these operations, right? And you can put these red parentheses in so you can kind of see this in an algebraic form. This tree here is kind of, we're grouping this way with these parentheses, right? When we do a balance tree, we're kind of grouping things this way. So we do a sum, do, do four sums in parallel, and then we add those two, right? And then we add the final two together. So what property is this? Well, this is associativity. Um, so this idea of doing, being able to change the order, change the, the kind of shape of the tree and reorder how we do the reductions, this relies on the property that the operation here, I've shown it as plus, I said we can have Boolean operations in here too, like and or or. Those uh, works, those have to be associative in order to take advantage of this property, right? Uh, not, all, not all operations are associative. For instance, think about division, it's not associative, or a min-max operation. It's not associative either. And this could cause us problems later when we try to optimize the circuit because we can't do that upper, if we have a large reduction to do, we may not be able to do it as a balanced tree. And this actually will come up later specifically when we talk about addition because addition has this kind of long property, this, this long chain here in the, in the carry as we talked about with ripple adders, they have a long carry chain here. And we'd like to be able to do that carry operation as a tree, but we can't because it's not associative. So we have to come up with another way of building the adder. So we'll talk about that uh, later when we do addition um, next week or the week after. Okay, so think about balanced trees when you wanna get performance in hardware, right? Because it kind of maximizes the parallelism. Oh, the other th interesting thing about these trees, uh, even though this, this uh, unbalanced tree, the one on the top, has order n delay, the balanced tree, binary tree, has order n delay, uh, they both have the same number of operations, right? They both have eight operations, but it just so happens the way we arrange them in the, in the tree form gives us less delay, right? Okay, so um, we looked at that tree for doing this kind of grade calculation that we did earlier, that example. And uh, I put the parentheses in now to show how we associate the operations, right? In order to lead to this structure of a tree. Uh, is there a different tree organization that will give us a different trade-off between cost and performance? And there is, uh, if we also bring in factoring, uh, we can use factoring and associativity and we can factor it this way. We can factor this 0.2 out, obviously. It seems a bit redundant to keep multiplying 0.2 times the three midterms grades. If we wanted to save work, save on the number of operations, we could factor out the 0.2. And then, um, oops, there shouldn't be a parenthesis here, but we can add the three midterm scores together and then multiply it by Point two. So we actually save on multipliers here. We need still need a multiplier if we want a parallel implementation to do 0.4 times the project grade, but we can save on some of the multipliers up here. What did this do for us? Well, by using this factoring and associativity, 
we have less hardware. There's fewer multipliers, as I said before. There's still three adders in here, but now there's only two multipliers. So this gives us kind of another trade-off. This gives us um, but a longer path through here. Right? This had only multiply and then two adds. The critical path here is three adds and a multiply. So increase the critical path of the circuit by the time, uh, you, because there's an extra add here, uh, but it's, uh, it's cheaper because there's fewer multipliers. Right? So that's another kind of way that we can do these trade-offs for these parallel implementations. Now we can actually take it further. Um, and um, we can share operators like multipliers and adders. So you can see here we have uh, three adders. We can think about doing each one of those add operations with a single adder and do it at different points in time. So likewise for the multiplier, we could maybe only have one multiplier and we could first do this and then do this later, right? So, or we could say, take all these operators and we have multiply and, 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 uh, and plus and just build a single ALU that can do either one or the other and just use that for kind of first do that, then that, then that, then that, then that, and kind of spread this computation out in time, right? So we can think about not just doing computation in space as I've shown in these two things, but also spilling over into time, right? So this gives us the other way to kind of trade performance for cost, right? Because if we only had a single unit that can do any of these operations here, it's gonna be a lot cheaper because we don't have to have, to have all these separate units. We can have a single unit, it's gonna be cheaper, but it's gonna be slower because we have to do the computation sequentially now. Right? So that's kind of what I've shown here in this implementation. Uh, this idea of, of using something over and over again is time multiplexing or multiplexing it in time. So here's kind of the extreme case that I talked about for this example where we have a single ALU that can action that can act as either an adder or a multiplier. Now, to get this temporal solution, serial, sequential solution working, we need to have more state, right? Because we need to make these connections. These connections that are here, we make in space on the surface of the chip. When we go to this time multiplex solution, those connections become connections in time. And a register is a connection in time. <laughs> so we need these registers here to provide these connections in time. So we're going to have a register to hold M1, and that's supposed to be M2, M3, and uh, the project score, because we need to hold on to them until we need them. And then we'll have a couple of registers here, which we'll, we'll call accumulators, which will give us the partial results to pass between different parts of the computation. All right. <clears throat> So then we can have a, so this is the data path here. It has two accumulators that the ALU can write into. We can choose which one. Uh, they feed back to the input of the ALU and the other inputs of the ALU can come from these, uh, this regis little register file here that's gonna be used to hold the, uh, the inputs, right? So then we can just have the controller X kind of programs the operation in, in its, there, you can imagine there'd be a finite state machine here that kind of just does these operations in the first state of the finite state machine. We could control this data path so that M1 and M2 flow into the ALU and then the result goes into the accumulator. And then the next state or the next cycle, we could take the accumulator, feed, that goes back around and then we can add an M3 to that. Okay, and then on the next cycle, we can uh, multiply 0.2, maybe it's hard coded in here, um, to the accumulator one value. Okay, and then um, on the next one, we can multiply 0.4 times the project score, and that puts that in the accumulator two. And then on the cy final cycle, we can add the two accumulators together and we'll get our result, and that's the final grade. So I didn't show all the details here, but you get the general idea about how we take this computation and we spread it out in time, right? So this would be a lot cheaper because there's only a single multiplier in here and a single adder, 
uh, we've had to add some extra logic for the control and for the registers, but in the end, this can be a cheaper but slower solution, right? So this kind of completes the trade-off, maximally cheap, sort of, and uh, maximally uh, slow, right? So this attempts to minimize the cost at the expense of time, as I said. Okay. So we had to add that, those extra pieces to make it work, but that's the way it would work. So if we adopt this approach, then um, we can kind of view this parallel version more as an abstract computation graph. It's really a graph that kind of shows us the available parallelism and what the computation is, right? But then we can implement it this way. We can implement it a lot of different ways, depending on how much parallelism we want to exploit. Right? In fact, when we do the things temporally, we covered this graph by an ALU that can do either a multiply or an add. It, if, if we had a functional block like an ALU that could do something more sophisticated, like multiply two things and add a third thing to it all at the same time, okay, that would lead to a different kind of number of cycles. In fact, we could do this computation in fewer cycles. And it would lead to a kind of a different hardware engine to do that computation. Right? So there's lots of possibilities here. And we have a full range of trade-offs between space and time. Oh, and that's a really good place to stop. Um, next time I'm gonna talk more about this idea of time multiplexing, and uh, we'll look at some more examples about how to exploit parallelism for uh, speeding up computations. So, just to make sure there's no final questions. Okay, it looks like not. Okay, so um, thanks for being here. And that's uh, going to complete the lecture for today. Today, so well, uh, we'll pick this up again on Thursday. So we'll see you on Thursday. Okay, bye bye.